welcome to the very first ever Peace of Mind podcast. So this is a brand new podcast that will talk about mental health and psychiatric conditions and the research and science behind these conditions. And we'll bring you conversations from patients affected by these conditions alongside researchers who are working at the very cutting edge of understanding an incredibly complex area of psychology and biology. So this podcast is brought to you by people working at the National Centre for Mental Health, uh, which I'll now refer to as the NCMH, and the MRC Centre for Neuropsychiatric Genetics and Genomics, which I'll refer to as the MRC center just because they're both mouthfuls and it's easier to talk in abbreviations. So I'm the research coordinator for the NCMH, which is actually split across Cardiff University, Swansea University and Bagley Universities. And it brings together world leading researchers uh, looking at the triggers, causes of mental health problems and aims to improve diagnosis, treatment and support for millions of people affected by these uh, by mental ill health every year. As well as this, it aims to tackle stigma faced by many. Uh, the key to achieving this is to engaging with service and their users, so working with the NHS, working with charities and th- third sector uh, companies, and the wider public to increase understanding of mental illness and by supporting and undertaking mental health research. And one of the things we thought would be good would be to bring a podcast to you to directly bring you stories from our participants and from our researchers so you have an idea of what we're doing and how you can get involved. We're also part of the MRC Centre uh, here in Cardiff, which is a uh, largest psychiatric genetics group in the UK and is established in 2009. It uses clinical, genomic, statistical, bioinformatic expertise to tackle challenges posed by uh, posed by psychiatric uh, new development, neurodegenerative disorders, with the aim of be- informing better diagnosis and treatment for the future. So... How will this po- podcast work? Well, we're hoping to bring you a range of different formats across the podcast series. But for our very first episode, one of the things we thought would be a good idea to do is to bring together a participant and a researcher. And for our very first podcast, we're going to be focusing on postnatal depression. So for that, I'd like to introduce uh, Laura Derney and Professor Ian Jones. Um, so Laura, I was going to introduce you both, but I think it's better if we get you to introduce yourself. So, Laura, if you could introduce yourself, that'd be fantastic. Hi, I'm Laura. I'm 34. I'm a mum of two little monsters. One is seven and one is four. Don't be deceived by Poppy's blonde curly hair. She is demonic. (laughs) I had peri, so during and postnatal on both my children, but was mainly diagnosed or with Poppy because I had many complications during both pregnancies. So in my first pregnancy, a lot of my mental health issues were missed. I got involved with the National Centre of Mental Health when I was involved with the Depressed Cape Shop Cymru and I was sat next to the National Centre of Mental Health guys at an event and it just made sense with what they do. And I think they've been trying to get rid of me ever since, but I've kind of adopted them as my family and especially... uh, prof who sat with us here he's he's never going to get rid of me so yeah it's a me. wonderful relationship it is. I love him to pieces. <laughs> and on my left hand side i've got professor ian jones so ian if you'd like to introduce hi so i'm ian i'm not going to tell you how old i am because i'm far far too old but um i'm a psychiatrist um, so I've trained in, in medicine and, and done psychiatry training, but uh, for many years, primarily, I've been involved in doing research. Uh, I'm director of the National Centre for Mental Health, and uh, we're absolutely delighted to have Laura uh, uh, working with us Aww. to do what's such important work, actually, what's really uh, uh uh, you know, and 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 the experience of Laura and 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 meeting and talking through with Laura really emphasises why what we're doing is really important. I think he always says the nice things. <laughs> it's a charmer. <laughs> I know. I think the best place to start is um, obviously we're going to have people who know about postnatal depression, perinatal depression, but there's going to be people who are also listening who might not know as much, and I hopefully will be using this as a resource to learn a little bit more about mm-hmm. it. So, Ian, could you explain to us what is postnatal depression and It'll be quite interesting to find out why uh, it's an area that you find so interesting and how it is so unique as a a disease group. Okay, so what do we mean when we use the term postnatal depression? Um, Well, postnatal depression, postnatal or postpartum means um, following childbirth. So when we use that label, we're talking about episodes of of illness, episodes of of depression that come on after having a baby. And very simply, that's what, 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 what we mean. I suppose there's a bigger question then about what do we mean by depression, actually, because um, 
And I, probably what I'd want to say about that is that uh, when we talk about depression as a as an illness, as a uh, as a clinical condition, we're not talking about just feeling sad. We're not just talking about the ups and downs that we all experience in life. We're talking about something that can be incredibly serious, incredibly severe, and can really be some of the most devastating uh, uh, health conditions that people can experience. So. So very simply, we're talking about depression as a as an illness. We're talking about this; these are significant episodes of illness, and we're talking about those episodes that come on after having a baby. So, Laura, when we when, could you tell us a little bit more about how you came to be diagnosed with uh, postnatal depression and experiences yeah. behind it? When I was I'm going to take you back many years to when I was pregnant with Jack, I had extreme morning sickness, but it was missed. So I was lighter giving birth than when I found out I was pregnant and I was really scared throughout the entire time and I was having all these silly little, they're not silly, but OCD things where I had to have a separate fridge because I was already being sick so much. So what if I got ill? What if... It sounds horrible when you say it out loud, doesn't it? When And if Henry had made me poorly, it's my husband. I couldn't afford to be sick on top of being sick. And I was so skinny, not in a good way, that I just looked like I had a beach ball on my front. Like I, no one knew I was pregnant unless I kind of turned around and they did that whoa thing because I was big at the front. But I also then started to have these night episodes of vomiting and kind of fitting and initially when we had them we thought I was miscarrying so an ambulance was called by the time my two amazing ambulance men which we call Bert and Ernie and we've actually seen them recently when my son had concussion and we went into the children's hospital not in an ambulance but they're outside they didn't remember me I remembered them but by the time they arrived I was more concerned with like how the cat if he had enough food when we were in hospital so they were like well what's wrong with you Forward then three months, I'm still having these fits. They just say, oh, it's the baby lying on your sciatic nerve. That's why you can't walk. That's why you can't sleep. You're just being sick. Don't worry about it. First child, you're being over the top. Yeah. Had Jack and the midwife said at the time, she's not right. Somebody should have picked up on something. Amazing midwives in the hospital. Then I went home and my cousin had had postnatal and we had moved house at eight and a half months pregnant. If you're listening to this and you're considering moving house and you're pregnant, don't do it. So Jack had a bed when he was born. I didn't because we had just moved into the house. We were still rebuilding everything. And I got home and I just wasn't right. Everyone then says it's baby blues. You're going to be fine. You know, Give it 10 days. The health visitor walked in and took one look at me and said, you need to speak to the mental health team. And I just went go away and I didn't talk to her for about two weeks my cousin Tara had uh, suffered with mental health issues when having had her son and she rang me and told me that if no uncertain terms that if I didn't go to the doctor that day she would drive down from Oxford and she would take me to the doctor my doctor was like an old school mom she was amazing mm. but what she did what she said you you did so she gave me antidepressants after talking to me and I was sat in the car park with them and I didn't want to take them and I rang her and her exact words to me were I'll ring your mother if you don't take them <laughs> so I reverted to being about 13 and I ended up it works, it taking works, yeah. it works <laughs> seriously you don't want to mess with a short West Wadian woman <laughs> So took my tablets. They then found out the reason that I was still being sick and um, having nighttime fits was my gallbladder had failed, but I didn't fit any of the profile because I was 24. So I think I've just made myself younger, actually, in my pregnancy, So because that would make him 10 and, and he's not 10. So we'll just let everyone else do the maths. But I, I didn't fit in the age bracket, which is, I think, fat, fair, 40 and female. Well, I was female, but that was about it. And also I was tiny after giving birth. But they found out it was my gallbladder, nearly kissed the ultrasound technician who was like, whoa, that's really messed up. That <laughs> Had my gallbladder out, my surgeon went, well, that was the reason you were depressed. It was because you couldn't parent and he threw my tablets in the bin. And that started probably the worst three years of my life yeah. where I had been told by someone that was a lot cleverer than me, that was a surgeon, that I wasn't ill in I wasn't mentally ill and but I started to sleep in a separate bedroom I would watch Jack sleep I 
it was horrendous. It was just, I was on edge. I was snappy. My, my husband's a, an ex-Scottish rugby player. Don't get too excited. It was like under 18s. Uh, and he's quite squat and like solid. I reduced him to tears on the floor. And then for some, you know, brilliant reason, well, brilliant because she is wonderful, even though she is a spawn of uh, the Elzebub, um, we got pregnant with Poppy. And she, well, I was really sick during pregnancy, but luckily my midwife picked up on it and sent me to the hospital. It was very fine. I had a conversation. I lied, you know, like you do. How are you doing? Fine. But then one day my mother-in-law came down. It's completely unrelated, but she made a cup of tea and that for some reason just triggered me off and I had a complete mental breakdown. I walked into the doctors. My doctor had retired. She had been replaced by someone that was my age. I was petrified that I would knew her or that she'd be younger than me and I'd be like, oh, you know nothing about life. <laughs> and instead she took one look at me, sat me down and she had, when things are just meant to be, it's really weird. She had just come to the GP surgery, but she, her last rotation in the hospital had been with my consultant who I was under for my pregnancy. So she rang her while I was in the room and they put me on like their watch list, so to speak, as well. Sure. She met with me once a week to check how I was doing because I couldn't take meds because I was pregnant. I was already on anti-sickness meds because I was throwing up again. It's a brilliant diet. She met with Henry uh, once every three weeks because he was basically a carer to a child and a pregnant woman mm. who was completely couldn't cope with anything. And then she met with the most honest person in our family regularly as well, which was Jack, because he was four at the time. And she would just play blocks with him in the corner and ask how mummy was doing. Now, I know a lot of people say a lot of negative things about doctors, but she genuinely saved my life by taking the time out to listen to me, to let me talk. And that talking therapy really kept me as sane as I was going to be during my pregnancy. After I had Poppy, obviously I knew more than the doctors and I refused to take my mental health tablets. See, looking back, I just think you're a blithering idiot. Because I had been on sickness meds, I just wanted two weeks medicine free. Mm. No. Uh, those two weeks, the brain's an amazing thing. I have very little recollection of those first two weeks. I do have a recollection of Henry's first day back at work where I rang him at about one o'clock and said, I need to see Dr. Clements. I need to see her now. And she, he rang the surgery and they were like, no, I'm sorry, she doesn't take phone calls on a Tuesday. He said, no, she, she'll she take this one. Just just tell her Henry Durney's on the phone. No, I'm really sorry. So he argued with the receptionist for 20 minutes. Pretty sure he's blacklisted now. Um, and he she he meant they mentioned his name to her. And I got into the surgery. She just walked me, basically frog marched me down. And she had my tablets there. And she was like, you, you know that you're not nuts. You're not crazy. People can't see I'm doing air quotes. Uh, you're not insane. You've got a chemical imbalance in your brain and you just try it. What's the worst that can happen? And I, I guess I've been, no, I have, I've been amazing ever since taking them. I've had the best four years. I've, the kids are, the Jack plays on it. Like if he doesn't get pudding, he asks if I've taken my crazy lady pill. He'll go into the doctors and like say, she needs her nut pills. <laughs> yeah. But we, we're really open and honest with it as a family now because we kind of had to be. Jack sure. lived through it. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's just made other things a lot easier where, you know, if stuff happens at school, we're quite an open family. And I think I've, I've spoken to prof when um, Jack sadly lost a friend through a car accident. And I was like, I, what am I doing? And it was really reassuring with the fact they were like, well, you're in a very open family. You talk about lots of things and it's quite a two-way street. But yeah, it's an interesting tale of two pregnancies that kind of merged into one mass breakdown at 20 weeks pregnant with Poppy. I think there's quite a lot of things there that you've mentioned there's that a are, lot. are really interesting. <laughs> um, like the first one I'd quite like to go, about. Oh, obviously, I mean, how does this, no, I'd quite like to ask you, is how does this chime with your experience of treating other patients? How typical or atypical would Laura, uh, Laura's experience be? Well, I think everybody's got their own story and their own experiences and every, and every woman's experience is different. But um, I suppose one couple of things I'd, I'd, I'd pick out of there is, is, is 
Pregnancy is difficult. Having kids is a massive change in your life. It can affect your physical health. And actually, that's one thing that came out of what Laura's just been saying mm-hmm. is that she had physical health problems. And these, you know, and that can increase our, our, our risk of having you know, you know, mental health can, problems as well. Um, having a baby is a time where joy is the expectation. It's almost the the, the, the given that this is a, a fun a time where women must be you know, shining, blooming and glowing. And, and glowing. I never glowed. But really? actually the experience <laughs> Maybe sweat. <laughs> of, of many women is, is, is that, you know, mm-hmm. but the postpartum and, per- and pregnancy related mood episodes, um, uh, postnatal depression, postpartum depression, isn't something that's just been thought up in the last five or 10 years as a new way to sell, you know, to sell drugs to, 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 to women. These are conditions that have been written about for hundreds, if not thousands of years we know that um you know, the the accounts even in the writings of the ancient greeks where uh, where women uh, experienced mood episodes in in relation to childbirth so so yeah Every woman's experience is different, but we do know that for some women, this can be a particularly difficult you know, life transition. And actually, if we think about what are the causes of, of, of what can trigger off an illness, I think it's, you know, as human beings, we are that complex interaction of our biology, of our psychology, of our social, of, you know, even the political. And actually, when we think about postpartum illness, that's no better illustration of that because there are big hormonal changes that happen in pregnancy in the postpartum period, and that important that major life transition to being a parent Mm -hmm. is undoubtedly important the changes in the other relationships that you have the relationship with your partner and your family all of that's going to be important And, and what motivates our research to try and understand that is the very strong belief that actually we'll only really understand these conditions by understanding these illnesses and all of these different levels. Uh, one of the things I want to uh, ask you both about is this key difference between the baby blues, the so-called air quotes again, baby blues, and postnatal depression. There's quite a, uh, there's a lot of people who tend to say, or there is a general uh, thought that by some people to say, oh, it's just baby blues, or it would have been previously. Mm-hmm. The baby blues is a thing, but it's not postnatal depression. Can you just like yeah. differentiate between them? Yeah, it, it, when we think about the kind of mood conditions that occur in relation to childbirth, we do think about the baby blues, about postpartum depression. Actually, something else called postpartum psychosis. I'll say something about. As far as the baby blues is concerned, this is a way that you know the, of describing a very, very common experience that many women have. Some studies suggest fifty percent, some even higher, sixty percent, eighty percent. That those days in that week after having a baby, there is 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 a, women can have very changeable m- moods. And actually, the blues is probably a misname actually because for many women it's not even low mood that they have, but they can just have very labile moods, moods that change all over the place. The important point to make up with the baby blues is it's not an illness, it's not a condition. It shouldn't be yeah, treated as such. It's you know it, it by by definition it passes that it it it, it doesn't la- last a long time. But the important point is to make sure that that those people uh, that are looking after women at this time are aware that it can, you know, that for some women it goes beyond that. Sure. For some women it becomes more severe, um, and for some women it can be much more lo- long lasting. So, so diff- picking up between those those d- those episodes of, of of what we'd call clinical depression that that can occur in those time and differentiating that from those kind of minor mood changes that happen to many women if if not most women is really important i think did you have uh, laura did you ever have any kind of uh, difficulties in explaining your condition to friends or family who might have misinterpreted it like ian says um about as the baby blues or as something as not postnatal depression or what was the effect in um, speaking to those who were close to you? I think the hardest thing was telling my parents because it feels, it's so unspoken about and the more you speak about it, the more people come out and say things like, oh, actually, actually, I've had this, I've done that, I know this person. Um, telling my mum was really hard because I remember I can actually be there now I've shut my eyes I'm in my parents kitchen and my mum stood up next to me and my dad sat on the chair and I remember her saying John I think this is serious and she automatically and it could be many reasons as I'd walked in with their first grandson in my child um, my child in my arms or 
she automatically wanted to protect Jack from those words of postnatal depression. But I had the hardest thing was sitting down and explaining to them that I didn't hate Jack. Because that's what people assume. They think postnatal depression, you've rejected the child, you hate the child. And it wasn't. I hated me. Like I I couldn't stand me. I couldn't function. I didn't like me. He was pretty awesome. Like, how did I create that thing? Like, look, <laughs> look at him. He's alive. That is my victory. Both children are still alive to date. <laughs> but that was the hardest thing because people assume you hate your child and you hear that word postnatal and they assume that you're going to try and your child off. Yeah, is that a worry, do you think, Laura? Is that, is, do, do you think people, do you think women are still not talking about the, their emotional symptoms yeah, that they're experienced they're because they're scared of, of having the baby taken away yeah. from them? Is that a real, is the stigma I still there so, to yeah. that level that, that that's a worry? I was involved in a perinatal discussion with the government recently and every single woman on the table all said the same thing that uh, apart from that we need a mother and baby unit in Wales it was we we were all scared that people had written us off as loony unable to take care of our child and they'd, they'd take the child away and it's it's things like that that stop women speaking about it until years afterwards and it's and that's brilliant that people are starting to talk about it and there are famous people starting to talk about it, but all the children now are like seven, nine. And I know I'm I'm just as, I'm putting myself in that box, but if you can speak about it when you're in, like I did when I had Poppy and I stood up and I remember being in like a mother and baby group and I was like, I'm not coping. I hated mother and baby groups. I remember just being like, I, I'm not coping. I'm, my child is not sleeping through the night. My child is not impeccably dressed. I am not here with my hair done, you know, and I'm I'm here and I'm not coping. I've got postnatal. And about three other mums just went, oh my God, us too. This is the first time that we've put on like clothes in four days. And talking about it then, that's when like the camaraderie needs to happen yeah. like it's it's all lovely that we're being reflective and it's amazing that it's being put in the press but the fear is real once you have a child like for starters you're trying to keep a small person alive you are on sleep deprivation yeah. and you are just it's the hardest it's the most wonderful and hardest time it's the most wonderful when I've got my tablets but it's it's hard and people are scared because it's so not spoken about they don't know what the repercussions are, and it was. It sounds to me from what the, the 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 moving story you told before was it was, it was only when you could talk to somebody you could you could tell your doctors and you know that you got the help that you needed, and that yeah. help. The other thing that was really interesting from what you were saying, I think, is that that help wasn't just medication, although that from yeah. what you're saying sounds like medication was a help for you, but it was somebody to. Listen to you, somebody to somebody be to there. Tell you you're not, yeah, you're not like well, you are, but you're not, you're not crazy. You know, kind of like the whole. It's okay. You're one in four. Mm. You know, it's that mm. conversation. There's what three of us in the studio. Yeah, you know, one in four. It's like it's a no, it's a huge figure. Yeah. And Jack says it perfectly. We've all got brains. So, what would you would your message to women that are worried about, you know, admitting that they're not. It's stronger to talk about it than to hide it. Okay. You're not weak. You're pretty kick-ass. Because if you're struggling with your brain and your like child is still there functioning um, and, and you are being a mum and everyone thinks that you are completely coping and you feel like inside you're falling apart, you, you're like an ultimate warrior. You've got like a 100% success rate of your really bad days. It's really strong what you're doing. But it's not weakness to ask for help. So do you have any ideas on how we could encourage women to speak out? I mean, the things that you do, I mean, uh, Laura's helped NCMH out at countless events and been is actually one of our research champions. We can ask you about that in a second as well. How can we get more women to, to speak about these things? And I think that's an uh, interesting point as well for Ian uh, to have, perhaps say something is how can we get people to speak more about their mental health and that whether they've had mental health conditions or not, how can we get that conversation going? Um, are we are we anywhere near beating the stigma associated with mental health conditions? Are we Do we still have a lot of work to do? I mean, 
are, is are this postnatal depression one of the areas in which we're making more strides than other areas, perhaps? I, I, I think um, I'm, I'm going to hand most of this off to, to Ian, but one of the things... I run a mental health organisation and um, what no one here probably saw was when Ian was talking about it not being an emotion, it being an illness, I kind of put my arms in the air and did a bit of a like a yay because we use the hashtag sick, not sad for that very reason. I find myself saying that continually, like this is not an emotion, it's not a choice, it's an illness. If it was an emotion, I would be like, I would snap out of it as I never want to feel like I feel on my bad days. I think we've still got a big fight because people still... Um, I, I've got an amazing goddaughter. She's 16 and I'm like her allocated adult friend on Facebook. And there's things that go up like, oh my God, she was so bipolar last night. And it's like, mm, really? Like bipolar is a serious illness. It's not the fact that one minute she's changed her mind and that and the other. But I think with the work um, that... Ian has done with people like EastEnders where they portrayed Stacey's postnatal psychosis was beyond helpful. Like I I remember watching it and just um, being in tears. I've, I've got a friend, a very close friend that had postnatal psychosis and it was just, it could have been done really badly. I've seen many a soap where they've done something like postnatal depression or depression and I've just gone like, Oh, what are you doing? You're reinforcing some of this. I've had an argument with a magazine editor who wanted to change my story to be that I didn't like the kids. And I was like, wow. no, no, I'm I'm not getting involved with you. You no, I'm not fitting your mould that you're re and I proper let, we will never be doing work with them because I ended up saying that they were reinforcing the stigma rather than doing what they wanted to do, which was fight it. But with EastEnders, um, Ian was involved in the script, which is why I'm going to hand over. And it was, she's an amazing actress. Is it Lacey Turner? Yeah, Lacey. She portrayed it wonderfully. There was no amdram. And the fact that they got someone who, a couple of people that are specialists in that area to help write it, just that has... That soap, the fact that I very rarely watch soaps, but I sat down and watched that and with my mum and the fact that you've got women and met families all around the country talking about it. You know, there's the hashtag real life Stacey's went on on social media. The amount of women who suffered, God, I'm getting like, I need a little soapbox to stand on, um, who had postnatal psychosis, which is even less talked about than postnatal depression. Is, was unbelievable. So I'm going to do a little clap to Ian because it was spectacular. And, and to Lacey, who did she won an award for it, didn't yeah, she? Yeah, she's, yeah. Blinking well really deserved. Successful. And actually, I think, you know, working with EastEnders, I mean, coming back to that um, uh, 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 issue about stigma, um, the, the, one of the key people that, that really drove this was a woman called Claire Dolman, who's a woman with bipolar disorder who's got lived experience herself of postpartum psychosis. And, and she, uh, and along with myself, went up and pitched the idea to EastEnders. And then, and then Claire sorted out for a number of women with lived experience of this condition to come and talk to the writers and the producers. Uh, and I think, you know, the BBC actually should, should take a lot of credit and the producers of EastEnders because they really did take the importance of listening to people who, who had gone through this on board. And I think, you know, in the end of the day, they, they're about, you know, doing a drama and that, you know, but they did take it incredibly be seriously. I do think that uh, in the area of, of, of perinatal mental health, that we are you know, doing some really excellent work here about uh, 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 dealing with, with, with stigma. I've worked with uh, the Maternal Mental Health Alliance in the UK who are doing some fantastic work to push for better services for women at this time and, and an incredibly key component of what they do um, including the kind of the, you know, you know, Emily Slater who's been the kind of director and, and is leading that is it, it's women with lived experience. Emily has had a severe postpartum depression herself and what Working with uh, those women has taught me what working with with Laura has taught me as and our other research champions is is the incredible importance of people who've lived through these 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 conditions the the power 
of lived experience is massively higher than people like me, clinicians, researchers. We can waffle on all we like, but actually it's the real stories of real people that that get through to people, that help people understand that actually this isn't something to be ashamed of, Mm -hmm. that this isn't any different from any other health condition. And that's where we need to get to. That's where we need to be. You know, we sometimes use this term parity, yeah, yeah, with with, with physical conditions. You know, we we, we have to get to that. And I, I, you know, I, I just give a clap back to, to, to Laura because I think that actually it's 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 people like Laura who are prepared to talk about their experiences in a in a way that shows that this isn't something to be ashamed of that has a massive impact so so well done thank you we've started with the organization I run we only use real people okay. and it's always re- it's always nice to hear someone that I I, I, I don't need anything when I say this but someone that I completely respect not only in your field but as, as a person we've we've done quite a lot of work together um, to reinforce that and like we've we've been collating their stories and we only use their words because it is much a stat is wonderful mm. but you know what giving someone a face is even more powerful because it shows that it's not a random person do you also think that it's about um, perhaps changing the language behind mental health and changing the terminology behind mental health to make um, it more acceptable as as part of uh, becoming more of a kind of like what what a social topic, we we, we do away with terms things like crazy or or nuts or I think we own them. Yeah, like I'm I'm happy. I I <laughs> I randomly I'm like well, I'm nuts, and somebody like especially at the school gate, if they don't know me, they go like, <laughs> and I'm like, oh no, I've got the prescription to to prove it. <laughs> and what's brilliant is my doctor, uh, his son is in the class next door to mine, and he sometimes goes, she has. Um, <laughs> But I, I think what it, the thing that needs to be is that people need to realise it's just health. And yeah. as Jack, he's seven. He's like, you've got a brain. It's part of your body. You've got a heart. It's part of your body. You've got a knee. It's part of your body. You don't sit there and go, oh, I've got bad knee health today. Yeah. And he's seven. And you sit there going, how does he get it? And so many don't. It should just be health. They, they're learning in schools to look after their bodies. Why aren't? You know, we're looking to look after their and brains. I, and I, actually, the rest of medicine can learn a lot from mental health as well. You know, we, you know we, yeah, there are there are psychological, there are social, there are political impacts on health across the spectrum. Whether that's you know, yeah, whether what we feed our kids in for school dinners and exactly. le- you know what we advertise on, all of these have impact on people's cardiovascular health. It's not just mental health that's this kind of left field thing where all of these things are important. Exactly. And that's my. I do think sometimes we get. Yeah, and I know language can be important, and I and and it, yeah, and people can 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 uh, take offence and things, and we need to get these things right. But actually, we need to be move beyond that because it is more important than yeah. just the language we use. Oh, okay. We have Somebody to get to the crazy. stage I'll where we where we you know where 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 mental illness, mental health conditions, however we want to, whatever label we want to you, where they're seen as uh, problems that we can. We can understand better, mm-hmm. and actually, and that's where it comes to research, and that's where the research we're doing is so important. I think yeah. because actually, you know, we really are only going to really change attitudes when we can show that these are conditions that we can understand and that we can do something about, mm-hmm. we can prevent, and we can treat. And so, the more research that we do along that line, for me, that's the key to take this thing forward. So. Uh, talking about treatments and research, they're two really in, obviously important topics, really interesting mm. topics. Uh, if we talk briefly about treatments, you spoke that you said that you're on uh, medications. Um, yes. There are other treatments available, obviously, for different people. There are. Um, there is, unfortunately, still stigma around uh, oh, taking yeah. so called pills and whatever. You take tablets, you're a bad guy. You don't take tablets, you're a bad guy. You take. You do CBT, you're a bad guy. You don't do CBT, you're a bad guy. You do talking therapy, you're a bad guy. You don't talk to. It's. <laughs> I get so frustrated because, and I can say this as I've checked this out, one of my friends who has a diabetic child, but you, you don't judge someone for taking insulin. Yeah. You don't judge someone going, I don't want to do radiotherapy. I want to do palliative care. So why do you judge me for trying to treat my chemical imbalance through um, tablets? Because it's not just tablets. I, I actually, I don't look it, but I go to the gym. And when I don't go to the gym, my mental health wavers yeah. and it's, it's because it's illness. It's not mental. It's not physical. It just happens to be that 
the imbalance portrays itself as as depression. And if I had an insulin imbalance and I didn't take my insulin because, you know, it was frowned upon, people would be up in arms. So why are people up in arms when I take a tablet? I always say that medication isn't for everybody because there are levels of men. Well, I, I, I'm looking at prof and hopefully, <laughs> you know, people's the thing is, the brain's complex. So some medicines work for some people and some don't. And you shouldn't just go. I agree. Sometimes tablets are handed out easy, but work out what works for you. If I, if I feel really good, I forget to take my tablet and then I go on a downer and my husband can read it like within seconds. He's like, you, you didn't take your tablet for the last two days, did you? And I'll go, I'm sure I did. I'm sure I did. They need to have all mental health treatment that's tablets needs to have the days on because I forget. Mm. But he'll know if I haven't been to the gym and if I haven't taken my tablet because I'll just go downhill. So it's something that I can record that it helps, if that makes sense. But yeah. if someone else takes the same medication as me, it might not help them because our brains are different. And that's the thing that, that people need to remember in the same way that um, if if we had the same, we, we both wear glasses um, just because you all can't see us. They've taken mine off. Um, we could have, we would need different, we need different lenses. So it's just because it's the eye. It doesn't mean that it's One size the same. Fits yeah. Yeah. I think, I mean, the important thing is what, what works. Yeah. And we know that there's really good evidence that medication can help some people with, with some conditions. And, and there shouldn't be that stigma involved, you know, and I, mm -hmm. this, I'm really pleased to hear Laura, Laura saying that. On the other hand, we need better treatments. We need yeah. treatments that don't have some as much side effects as we have at the moment. And the other thing we need is ways better of predicting who's going to respond to what treatments. Because sometimes in mental health, you know, in psychiatry, a it's just a, a long case of, of trying different things. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, and actually, the area of of of, of um, pregnancy and childbirth is an area where there are particular issues for taking medication. You know, you know, it's an area it's where really where there are some really difficult decisions that some women have to face about, you know, about whether to carry on or to start medication in pregnancy with, you know, some and unknown then afterwards with breastfeeding because yeah. some tablets go through to milk and some don't, and yeah. you can get. Conf um, mm. One of my friends was told by the drugs council that it didn't go through mm. and her doctor said it did and then she just hit a point where she was like I have I don't want to but I'm gonna from my own health because if she's not healthy the baby's not going to be healthy she stopped breastfeeding early and it it had a massive effect on her so I think there are some really difficult decisions to make and it's a matter of weighing up those risks those benefits mm -hmm. yeah and looking at the all the options available because we know that the, you know there are medications can be really helpful for depression but there are other treatments as well there yeah. are are talking treatments there is CBT and other things that can 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 help um the other thing I feel very strongly about is is that often pregnancy and breastfeeding are reasons to take people out you know, take women out of studies their exclusion criteria for studies mm -hmm. and actually there are not there's not much work done specifically looking at these uh, conditions and what treatments can help so i think that's a real area been a very encouraging um uh, study just recently published very small study that, that that looked at postpartum depression and looked at giving a kind of a hormonal infusion in, and it was in very small numbers and it needs to be replicated and, and and further work needs to be done but what i was really encouraged by that were that there were yeah uh, researchers out there that were for you know saying actually not postnatal depression is something that we'll we'll uh, yeah avoid yeah take yeah out of our studies but actually we'll do some research specifically to to try and understand what can help treat the, the, the this particular condition because wow. it is so, a long nine months it's a difficult well, it's time. 10 months difficult and these are very difficult decisions that yeah clinicians and women have mm -hmm. to make about carrying on stopping yeah yeah treatments i think that's a really good point to talk about um research um obviously if we talk about um our, any papers during this podcast we will try and make them available to anyone who's interested you can get in touch with us uh, by going to the ncmh website ncmh.info or checking us out on twitter or facebook again just type in ncmh or mrc center cardiff um 
The NCMH is actively involved in research. We are act- actively collecting and recruiting participants. Uh, Laura is one of our awesome participants, as is one of your children. And my dad. And your dad. I think we were the first three generation Fantastic. family. Fantastic. That's, like, that's a proper And I've just found affair. out Poppy's allowed to donate DNA, so she'll be down next week, I'm sure. So... Um, Ian, if you could tell us a little bit about um, some of the work that NCMH is uh, doing and uh, if anyone is interested as a result of this uh, podcast to become a a volunteer or a participant or just interested in in collaborating with us as a researcher and we were more than than, uh, open for that. So... So in NCH, one of the most important things that we're doing is to build a, 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 a group of people with mental health conditions who are uh, who are working with us to try and understand these conditions better. Um, in NCMH, we we are interested in hearing from people who've uh, had any mental health condition or even no mental health conditions, because actually it's very useful for us to have the help of people who maybe have not suffered themselves, you know, and, and to uh, ha- have them available for controls for 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 study. Um, oh, we've recruited in now well over 7,000, 7,500 or more. It goes up all the time, right. which is fantastic. And, and uh, you know, and as well as hugely thanking Laura, who's a kind of sitting here as a representative of all those people, I just really want to thank all of those people because yeah. um, it's something that we strongly believe in in the NCMH is that is it's only through research that we're really going to make the major advances that we can to, to make Absolutely. things better. Mm-hmm. Um uh, the help that we ask for people, we, people can sign up on our website. They can uh, uh, give consent to be part of our uh, NCMH family. Um, uh, and they can uh, uh, fill out some questions and give some details about the, their mental health. And then for certain people, we'll re- contact them if there's a particular conditions that we're, we're researching at the time. Uh, for example, postpartum depression. Um, mood disorders is one of those at the moment that we'd be very interested to hear people from. Then perhaps a member of our research team would come out uh, who are a lovely bunch of people. And then Laura can, can confirm lovely. that <laughs> um, and can see people um, uh, in their own home, um, can take a fuller, uh, more information. Um, one of the things that we talked about before and one of the things I was very keen to point out was that we need to understand these conditions at all levels from the biological, the psychological and the social. Mm-hmm. So we take, do a lot of kind of psychological assessments and and, and uh, ask questions about uh, social factors. Um, but also we take um, uh, blood at the moment for uh, or, 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 or saliva for uh, so that we can look at, uh, as, as Laura was saying about, to, to uh, collect DNA from so we can look at the role that genetic factors and undoubtedly play in making some people uh, more vulnerable or less vulnerable to these conditions. So so we're taking that kind of holistic approach. We're asking for the help of of, of anybody, but there are some particular conditions that we're very interested in. And, and, and postpartum mood disorders are, are one. So if people have suffered postpartum psychosis or postnatal depression and want to get in touch, we'd be really interested to hear from them. Fantastic, yeah, and as as Ian says, we are looking for samples uh, from part from participants, and I'm actually the person that handles the sample, so I can say it's handled very, very to the highest <laughs> standard. Going, that is true. Your boss is sat next. Yeah. To you my as well. boss is sat next to <laughs> Ian. <laughs> yeah, he also knows what I'm doing today. So. Um, <laughs> I think I think a lot of what we've spoken about is 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 great. I mean, one of the things I'd I, last couple of questions I suppose I'd like to ask is regards to the genetics because of what we do uh, with NCMH and the MRC Centre um, is if, whether there's anything being uncovered with regards to the genetics in postnatal depression. And secondly, to ask you both. Um, where you see um, the field of postnatal depression going? Are we are we on an on an up? Is it an optimistic future that we can hopefully beat some of these stigmas, get more people involved in research? Um, I always think it's on an up. We're talking about it. Yeah, so, which is very good. Yeah, like how many very positive. how many years ago this this wouldn't have happened? Yeah, exactly. You know, this is going to be available for anyone to download, and that's that's huge. I also think that. The re- one of the many reasons I think it, it's on the up is I spoke at the midwifery conference recently and they're realising, well, that they've known for ages. People people underestimate the fact that midwives know this stuff, but they they are starting to get the support to be able to do more mental health training as midwives because having that support earlier will help so many women because the midwife is the port of call. 
think we're heading in the right direction. I'd like to think we're heading in the right direction. I'm going to keep standing on my soapbox until we're going in the right direction. We'll keep, we'll keep giving you microphones. Yes. Well. Yeah. I love a microphone. So taking those two, two questions, I'll, I'll come back to what Laura ju- just said then, but just the questions about the genetics. Sure. I think, That's got to be One you. of the things <laughs> that we we uh, yeah, kind of have a world reputation in Cardiff yeah, in, and in Wales for, is for doing genetic research. And in some areas of, of psychiatry, in, 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 in schizophrenia, bipolar disorder, ADHD and others, there's been some really incredible advances and we are identifying those genetic factors, you know, that individually only nudge risk up or nudge risk down by a little bit. But identifying those is helping, giving us an understanding of what the, the biology of some of these conditions are. So it's a really exciting time in psychiatric genetics. Um, what's been clear is because of the complex nature of this, as we've talked about, because everybody is different, we need incredibly big numbers of people in studies. One of the benefits is, is that, that's been in recent years is that we've linked up with research groups around the world that are doing this work. And that's been a fantastic example of how, you know, researchers not competing with each other but researchers coming together as really advanced things it's it it takes samples of tens of thousands in order to to be big enough to us to be really confident that we can identify the, these genes we have those samples for some conditions for the postpartum conditions for postnatal depression for postpartum psychosis we don't at the moment but we are putting those samples together. We're collaborating as part of what is called the PACT uh, uh, Consortium. We're working with groups around the world to try and build those samples. So, so you know, I can only uh, emphasise again, if people listening have experience of postpartum uh, illness, of, of postnatal depression, of postpartum psychosis, then to get in touch with us in NCMH and become part of this family that's trying to do the work. And we really will try and build that, 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 that sample. Yeah, so just to reiterate what uh, Ian's saying, if you are interested in any of the work you do, we do, get in touch with us uh, at NCMH or at MRC Centre Cardiff on Twitter, Facebook, Twitter pages, email us as well, ncmh.info. We all have human faces. Um, our communications guy, Paul, is looking at me through the glass and he's the one who will answer your, answer your emails as well. So you can get in touch with us about anything that you hear or if you're interested in any of the work that we do. We can only really do the work that we do with our participants. If it wasn't for our participants, we would not have a centre to be able to do any of the research that we want to do. I think now is a great time to end things and just to say a huge thank you to both Laura and to Ian for taking time out of their very busy schedules to actually sit down and have this conversation. And I really hope that it's given whoever's listening uh, or anyone an opportunity to learn a little bit more about postnatal depression and learn about some of the work that NCMH does and hear Laura's story as well. And ultimately, if it's broken a stigma down or has enabled anyone to come out and speak about their experiences, I think that'll be a fantastic achievement for everyone. So again, if you're interested, if you want to get in touch with us, please do. Um, there are the charities Mind, Haffle. There's lots of resources on our website. And thank you very much for listening. And we hopefully you'll hear from us soon. Mm-hmm.